the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our beloved fathers, deacons, nuns, and our beloved congregation, all of you who are present here in this holy church of St. Shimon Bar Sabaya in St. Mary's Cathedral, and those who are watching us through live streaming, may the Lord Jesus bless you. May the Lord Jesus guide you, protect you, and deliver you from every evil tribulation, whether it be visible and or invisible. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Today's gospel is from the Gospel of St. John, and our church fathers have taken two segments, one from chapter 9 and another from chapter 10. To be more precise, it is John chapter 9, verse 39 till the end of the chapter, and it is chapter 10, verses 1 to 21 inclusive. We won't have the time to go through every single verse that is written in this gospel and read to you, my beloved, but we'll say a few words that should not take more than 10 hours. And I will leave you with this. Ni hao, ho ho. The Lord Jesus begins by saying, I, come, I came to the judgment of this world. And what is the judgment? He said, those who do not see, they shall see. But those who do see, they will be blind. This is the judgment. I came to the world for the judgment of this world. For those who see, will not see. But those who are blind, they shall see. They were Pharisees. And the Holy Bible mentioned specifically Pharisees. The Israelite nation is made out of three main groups. There is the priests, there is the scribes, and there is the Pharisees. These three groups, as far as they were concerned, they were the only ones who worship the true divine God. Everyone else outside of these groups were polluted, even though they were from, from an Israelite background, they were polluted by other nations and obviously the non-Israelites pagan to the core. So the priests, scribes and Pharisees, these were the main groups of the Israelite nation, the true worshipers of the true divine God. So there were Pharisees nearby the Lord when he said, I came to the judgment of the world for those who do not see they shall see, and those who are blind, and those who see, they shall be blind. They came to the Lord and said, Are you talking about us? The Lord said to them, If you were to say that you are blind, you have no sin. But since you say you see, then your sin remains. If you were to tell me, that you are blind, I wouldn't have held any sin against you. But since you came to me and said, we do see Lord, not even Lord, we do see Jesus, then your sin remains in you for as long as you say, we see. And then the Lord goes later on and more so into chapter 10, where he says, I am the good shepherd. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever does not enter through the gateway of the sheepfold is a thief and a robber. If you don't enter through the door to the sheepfold, he said, you are a thief and a robber. And then the Lord come, goes on again and he says, I am the door or I am the gateway. And the gatekeeper opens the door for me and when I enter my sheep hears my voice and heed to my voice they follow me for they recognize my voice 
but they do not follow a stranger's voice. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. I came to the judgment of the world. Those who do not see, they shall see, and those who see shall be blind. When we look around us, the 21st century, the 21st generation, generally speaking, the vast majority of this generation, they say we see. The vast majority of this generation, they say we see. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Every time you see the word I, E-Y-E, I, in the Holy Bible, it means knowledge. Replace the word I with the word knowledge. So seeing is to do with the I and it's to do with knowledge. So what the Lord is saying, He said, I came to the judgment of the world Whoever says to me, I know everything, to me they are blind. But whoever comes and says, I know nothing, then I will give you an eyesight no one ever gave you before. You come to me and you claim that you are educated. You come to me and you claim that you are Mr. Know-it-all. You come to me boasting about your wisdom and about your strength and about your fame your power, your throne, your ranks, and the stars on your shoulders, I do not know you. I came to those who say, Lord, without you, I'm blind. Without you, I'm nothing. Without you, I'm ignorant. Without you, I am the weakest of all. Have mercy on me, son of David. Have mercy on me. When the Lord was going on to Jerusalem, there was a man on the wayside, blind. He cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. So this blind man on the wayside cried out to the Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. The Lord commanded the disciples to bring him to him. When he was brought to the Lord, he asked him, what, what can I do for you? He said, Lord, I want to see. I am blind. You see, my beloved, if a blind man comes to a wretched person like me and I ask him, what can I do for you? We all know what a blind person is going to ask for the most. Obviously, he wants to see. So what kind of a question, what can I do for you? Can't you see I'm blind? How much more Jesus Christ, who is God, revealed in the flesh, the source of wisdom, the omniscient, the omnipotent God, the all knowledgeable God. Didn't the Lord know what this blind man wanted? Of course he did. But what was, why was he asking him this question? Because Every time the Lord Jesus asks a question, it is a rhetorical question. The Lord is asking you in order for you to find out what do you want and how are you believing in the Lord. He wants you to find out, not Him. He knows who you are and what you are and what you want before you know it. So it was a rhetorical question. What can I do for you, Lord? I want to see. He said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Instantaneously, he regained his eyesight. You see, what the blind men really said, which the Lord saw in him, great faith. He said, Lord, if I'm going to ask you to open my physical eyes, death will blind them again. Death will shut them again. I don't want to ask for temporal things. I'm asking you, Lord, I want to see, not with these eyes. 
I want to see with the eye of the Spirit. I want to see with the eye of faith. I want to see you, Lord. And in order for any one of us to see the Lord, we can never see him through the naked physical eye. We must see him through the spiritual eye. Now here is the secrecy in here. What is the secret behind having our spiritual eye opened or shut forever? One thing, if I come to the Lord and say, Lord, I know what I'm doing, I came to your house. I prayed for you. I built a church for you. I preached for you and brought thousands and millions of people to you. The moment you speak to the Lord in this particular way, the Lord says, you are blind. You don't know me. But when you come to the Lord and say, Lord, today I came to your holy church, to your holy house, seeking your mercy. I'm a sinner. Today I'm coming with a great lot of burden on my shoulders. I've got too much carrying on my shoulders, too many mistakes, too many sins, too many shortfalls, too many errors. I have offended your holy name, Lord. Today I'm coming seeking your forgiveness. I'm blind, open my eyes. I'm a sinner, sanctify me, Lord. I am lost, find me, Lord. I am weak, strengthen me, Lord. I am fallen, put me back on my feet, Lord. I am spiritually dead, revive me, Lord. This is the moment when Christ will open your spiritual eye and you will see him. When you confess that you're nothing without the Lord, then the Lord will reveal himself to you 100%. I've tried it, works every time, without fail, without fail. Today, the 21st century, the majority of people say, we know what we're doing. That's why it's a blind generation. Because they say, we know what we're doing. It's a blind generation. Someone that claims to see is a person that leads their life according to their own way of thinking, not God's. They want to rule over their life, not Christ. And today that's what we are witnessing. No wonder the world is in turmoil. No wonder the world in absolute destruction. Look at the world, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. The people they clap for on the world stage are absolutely blind. Who are you clapping for? Some childish person standing on the stage laughing at you and laughing at himself? The world has lost wisdom because they say, we are God on earth. Shame on such people, lost ignorance. And I'll give him another blessing, idiots. A professor, a scientist in biology, in chemistry, in the medical field, they study, I can't, I can't deny they studied very hard. And they have PhD in that field. And they teach at university levels with all the knowledge they've gained in that scientific field. They come and say, there is no God. You cannot be more ignorant than this. You cannot. 
like Stephen Hawkins and the likes of him. Richard Dawkins, Steve Hawkins died. The greatest physicist in the world remained in a wheelchair for years and years and years. And the only thing that was functional in his entire body were the, um, the, 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 the vocal cords. That was the only thing functional, the vocal cords. They connected that to a synthesizer into the computer and through the waves of this vocal cord, the synthesizer converted it into words that appeared on a screen. He died nowhere near finding out how the universe was created. <laughs> no one will ever find out. They will rot in the grave and they will never find out. Until they confess their sins and come back and acknowledge the Holy Bible where at the very beginning of the Holy Bible, Genesis chapter one, verse one, so simple, so easy. They go around beating around the bush. They spend years and decades researching and studying and they rot in the grave and they will never know how the universe was created. It took an ignorant person like me a second to find out how it was created. I just opened the Bible, Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth thank you see you later go home but Jesus oh, I came to the judgment of this world these people are asleep Jesus already came to the judgment it's done these people they will encounter one thing the grave and after the grave the judgment of Christ and woe unto them if they do not repent before they go down to the pit. Woe unto them. Believe you me. Believe you me. Jesus Christ. If you think Satan is scary, Satan is nothing to the awesome power of Christ. When he shows his mighty power, there is no one more scary than Jesus. No one. He is all love, but he is all justice as well. And when he reveals his power, the lion becomes a little mouse. I'll tell you a true story. I like keeping you back as much as I can. <laughs> cancel your dates, cancel your uh, whatever you have. Tafalak. This saint this saint moved on recently. She was the mother superior of a convent nuns where nuns live. Some people say, why do you need nuns and monks? That's not Christian way. <laughs> Very childish. So this mother superior, she was in charge of this convent. There was a lot of nuns under her authority. Her name was, is, will always be Timav Irini from our beloved Coptic church. Timav Irini was chosen by the Lord Jesus to be a nun. Timav Irini, she used to speak to this saint face to face, not in a dream, not in a vision, but face to face in reality, while she is fully awake, fully alert. This saint lived in the third century. She spoke to him face to face in the 21st century. One day, she was in her cell, in her room, praying. It is her talking, but the video was revealed after she moved on. It is her, herself talking, not a movie, herself, the real, the real saint. She said, I was in my room praying in my cell. The angel of God appeared in the cell and he said to me, greeting for my master, Jesus Christ has sent me to you 
to take you to him because he misses you. She said, but I'm still in the flesh. I can't go to heaven with the flesh. She said, the angel came back and said to me, do you know who Jesus Christ is? There is nothing that can stand in the Lord's way. He grabbed my hand. We flew so fast. In a split second, I was in front of a humongous citadel. She said, the gate opened. There was a very long corridor. She said, I am still in the flesh. I can feel everything. I can see everything. I am still fully alert, awake. It is not a dream. It is not a vision. I was not asleep when the angel took me from my own cell. She said, I saw a very long corridor and at the end of it, there Jesus was so majestically sitting on the throne as the king of all kings. She said, from fear, I fell on my face. That actually reminds me of Revelation, John the Beloved. He said, when I looked at him out of fear, I fell on my face on my face as if I were dead. Same, same. It is the same Jesus, yesterday, today, and forever. Never changes. She said, I fell on my face from fear, from the awesome, majestical way that Jesus, I saw him. I've never seen him like this before. And with his so tender voice, fatherly, so merciful, so compassionate. He said, daughter, do not be afraid. It is I who have called you. Don't be afraid of me. Come forth, my daughter. She said, I crawled on that corridor, that long corridor. I could not stand on my feet. I was shaking inside and out. I crawled on my face all the way and I got so close to him, I could see his sandals on his feet. And when I looked at his feet, I couldn't raise my face. When I looked at his feet, I saw the sandals and I saw the place of the nail in his feet pierced. And he knew I was so scared, so afraid. He wanted to comfort me. All I saw, a beautiful hand extending, placing it under my, my cheek, uh, my chin, sorry, placing it under my chin. And he lifted my face all the way to his face. She said, I was within a couple of centimeters, eye to eye, face to face of God himself, the king of all kings. He said, my daughter, do you know why I called you to me? Why, Lord? One, because I love you and I miss you. Number two, because I want to show you who I truly am. And I'm going to show you things in heaven and things in hell. And then I'll send you back, my daughter, the way I brought you to me. I'm going to send you back with my angel. I want you to go and tell my children, I am not a myth. I am real. My children have forgotten me. My children have forsaken me. They think they are reading a myth. It is a mythical story, something of an imaginary thing. They have forgotten that I am the truth. Go and remind them what you have seen today. Christ is the truth. Christ came to open the eyes of the blind only. Christ came to heal the sick. And the Lord said it. He said, if you are not sick, why do you need the doctor for? Would you go and visit a doctor when you are healthy? No, you'll only visit the doctor when you're sick. 
and I feel sorry for the doctors. <laughs> they never find somebody coming in intact. They're all <laughs> broken. But that's their job, to heal the sick. Those who have conscience. Some doctors have sold their conscience. But the doctors are put there to heal the sick. The Lord came to give us His sight. I am the light of the world. Who He, who he follows me shall walk in the light. Darkness will never comprehend Him. Today, the world is saying, we see, we know. And that was the problem from the very beginning. And I'll leave you with this. <laughs> I feel sorry for you. That was the problem from the, very from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. When the Lord God warned Adam out of love and concern as a father to his own child. He said, Adam, whatever you do, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What kind of a tree was it? Knowledge. Not apple, not apricot, not an iPhone with a beaten apple on the side. This, mm, you cannot try and change the truth, you evildoers. They've put an apple and they call it Adam's apple. Get lost. It's got nothing to do with the truth with the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible said the tree name was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is not a fruitful tree or of any fruit. It's a tree of the knowledge. God said to Adam, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat from it, surely you shall die. You know why God said that? Because he said, Adam, the day you come and eat from it, meaning the day you get to know what is good and what is evil, your beginning will be good, but your end will be evil. For the day that comes any human being, any human being begin to define what is good and what is evil, their beginning will be good, their end will be evil. We are not supposed to be the definers of what is good and evil, only God qualifies. Only God qualifies. And when I say we are not the definers of what is good, I'm speaking in the absolute term. I'm not talking about basic daily to day, day to day basic things. No, it is good for you to eat. Don't say I'm not the definer, I'm not going to eat. Don't do that. I'm talking the absolute because how can I know what is goodness in its fullness and what is evil in its fullness unless I am infinite? Since I am asking questions, I'm not qualified to define what is good fully and what is evil fully. Since I ask, I'm saying to myself, I don't know everything. Since I don't know everything, can it be possible that I call something good that could be evil? Since I don't know everything, I could call good evil and I could call evil good. Because I don't know everything, I could misdefine it. That's why God says, the day you become the definer of what is good and evil, you'll die. You will kill yourself by yourself. And this is exactly what the people of this generation are doing. Precisely, they are eating and they have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil one more time. We are the definers of what is good and evil. I wish, I wish you could take all your iPhones, all your iPads, and all of your iPods, so I don't have to iPad for you. 
I wish you could take them all and smack him at back at Bill Gates. Technology is one of the ways of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Technology has destroyed the world. When this pandemic started at the beginning, I did a small lecture. Some people misunderstood what I said because they were, I was, we were receiving a lot of questions. Is this vaccine the mark of the beast? Is it Bishop or not? So since we saw a lot of questions were coming, asking the same thing, we decided to talk. And when we spoke, some people misunderstood it and was taken out of context. I said, my beloved, you're saying, you're asking, is this jab the mark of the beast or not? I said, before you go to the jab, let me tell you one thing. People's brains have been washed, gone with the wind decades ago, not now. The day iPhone came out, your brains were washed. One of the means, one of the ways to the mark of the beast is the technology, internet, Facebook, TikTok, Mikmok, Wikwok, Wakwak. We sit for hours on end on Facebook, for hours on end on internet. And I, I am struggling to sit in the church for two hours because the bishop is preaching. Father Isaac was, it's only half an hour, 40 minutes. He's a good man. I'm an old man. I speak and I forget how long I've been talking for. We struggle to sit in the church for two hours, yet I will sit 24 hours nonstop. <laughs> The brain is washed. Believe me. Believe me. We lost our human identity when we looked into this little screen. One day I was in Sydney Airport going to Melbourne. Good old days, baby. <laughs> prior. It was prior to the pandemic, okay? So I'm not jabbed, okay? So relax. It was prior to the pandemic. So I was sitting at Sydney airport at the gate, awaiting to board the plane. A thought came in my head. I said, let me look around and see how many people, the people in the airport, I want to see how many are talking face to face and how many are looking into the screen. None were talking face to face. Everyone was like this. I just wanted to see a face like this to say, hello, my name is Ahmed, Allahu Akbar. You know, make it more exciting. I've got, a, I've got, a, I've got, you know, bombs on me. Watch out, baby. Nobody was looking up. Everybody was looking down. I waited and I waited and I waited and the airport was full of people. None of them were looking at each other. Everybody was looking at the screen. The brain is cooked, is washed. What's this? This is gone. That's what I was trying to say. I didn't say that this jab is not poison. No, but I was saying, don't focus on this jab being the mark of the beast because internet have fixed humanity a long time ago. Before in 1947, I'll leave you with this 100%. In 1947, TV was invented for the first time in the history of mankind by America. Ach, America, ach. That was the Arabic language, ach. Uh, English, ouch. <laughs> America invented TV. There was only two channels, black and white, no color, black and white. And guess what? Both channels were run by Christian groups. 
with Christian principles, values, and ethics, the, hu the human presenter, especially the woman, and with all love and respect to every daughter of mine that is present and that is watching me. I love you, my daughters. You are my eyesight. I love you. When the woman came on TV, she was fully covered from head to toe. Today, the woman comes out on TV, she is fully naked from head to toe. The cycle is reversed. And this is what Revelation 13 talks about the second beast making an image of the first beast and forcing the human race to worship the the, the image which he has made of the first beast. And that image is technology. Today, people are worshiping people on the net, on the net, coming in colorful ways, naked, dancing, twisting themselves. People worshiped. The brain is washed. We need to pray. After Sunday resurrection, we're going to begin with us coming together into the church one day a week for prayer. I beg you. I beg you. We're not going to come to listen to the good looking bishop preaching or anyone else. We're not going to come to listen to somebody singing. We're not gonna come to some, listen to somebody talking. We're gonna come and bend these knees and make them hit the ground in prayer. We need to pray. So, let us come as a family. Let us come as a family and make this family a family of prayer. And every week, we pray for whatever intention we may have. For example, this week, we're going to come and we're going to pray for all the plans of Satan and the secret societies to be put to shame. We pray to you, Lord, put them to shame. They say we need to reduce the world's population. Lord, increase it. They say, we're going to lock you, Lord, release us. They're going to say, we're going to kill you. Kill them, Lord, with your justice, with your justice. You don't kill, but you give the wage of those who do evil because you're just. You came to give life, but those who deny you, they will kill themselves. Because the only source of life is Christ. And when you shut the door in the face of Christ, then you're dead. Lord, you know everyone. And you know who's going to come to you and repent and who is not. Lord, give him a lesson. Teach him one. They will never forget. Neither in this life nor in the next. Pray. Another week, we pray for families. For Christ to be in every family. For Christ to bless the husband and the wife, the father and the mother and the children, the fruits of these parents. We pray for the broken families and we pray for those who are close to Christ to be preserved and protected. But we pray for healing for those who are broken and wounded by the enemy. We need to pray. What do you say? That rhymes. We need to pray. What do you say? I'm a poet. <laughs> Speaking of prayer, here comes the joke. This joke was delivered to me by an angel, a very young girl, stunning, gorgeous. So she said this joke. She said, 
What did the lettuce, lettuce, you know, the, um, the one you eat, lettuce? What did the lettuce say to the church? I said, I don't know. The lettuce said to the church, let us pray. <laughs> so every time you eat a lettuce, let us pray, baby. But please don't bring lettuce to the church. I'll kill you. My name is Ahmed. <laughs> Come to the Lord and say, Lord, I am blind. Please open my eyes. I want to see you, Lord. Lord, I am nothing without you. Yet I'm a doctor. Yet I'm a scientist. Yet I'm a professor. Yet I am a pope. Yet I am a bishop. But we need to come to Christ and say we're nothing because no matter how much we know, no matter how wise we are, Compared to the wisdom of Christ, we are absolutely blind, zero, zilch, ignorant. Come humbling yourself before your, your, your Lord. And let Christ open your eyes. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord's forgiveness to make us worthy to come forth and receive him in the Holy Eucharist, the true body and the true blood of Christ, our Lord, our God, amen. Our good God and full of mercy, our good God and full of mercy, whose grace and mercy is poured upon all, pour my Lord the compassion of the delightfulness of your love upon your servants and again transform them in the hope of renewal to the life of repentance. Renew in them your Holy Spirit by whom they are sealed for the day of salvation. Purify them by your compassion from all flesh and spiritual blemishes and assure the hope of their faith by the aid of your grace and instill the walks of their behavior and the paths of righteousness. Please them along with the saints in your kingdom by the assurance of the hope of their faith and the adoption as your children and in the joy of your absolving mysteries. Empower them by the aid of your mercies to observe your commandments and fulfill your will. To confess, worship, and praise your holy name, the Lord of all, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit forever. Amen.